Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. In, uh, in our homiletics class at the seminary, so this is the like how to give a sermon class that you take at JTS, uh, Professor um, Barry Katz would tell us that there are certain words that you can't use when you speak publicly. Because if you say blood, for example, no one's listening to you for the next three seconds. All they're thinking about is whatever it is that they think about when you say the word blood, right? And so you can't say things like that, or you couldn't say nude, or eagles, or colonoscopy, or something like that. And the list of things that I feel like a person who's speaking publicly, or a rabbi from the Bema, words that we can't use is growing. Because there's, some of the words are things that just are a little bit uh, invocative of certain things and you wouldn't want to say, but as the list of things that touch hot button issues that will immediately send half the room thinking to themselves, ugh, oh, this guy's the worst, right? Or something, whichever it is, that list is growing and growing and growing. Rabbi Sharon Brous, a rabbi out in LA, um, she calls them hom homiletic landmines, right? That as soon as you just say the word, climate, everyone goes off and thinks, oh, oh this, or I believe that, or I, I read a thing here, I read a thing there. Right? They're not listening to you anymore. They've pigeonholed you as a certain thing, and it's hurting our ability to have certain conversations that I think it's important that we have. And so I'm going to use a word right now that we're going to explain and talk about in a lot of different ways, but it could be potentially one of those words. And I think it is important for us to be able to have conversations that are coming from a place of love and depth and care and community, and we're all going to have kiddish together afterwards, and it's going to be great. Okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> Verbal nods of assent make me feel better. I appreciate it. So the word that I want to use that we're going to look at as it appears in our Parsha is the word privilege. <laughs> it's not that bad, right? Okay, yeah. Pri privilege, which means what? Privilege means that due to some reason, one person or one group has more of something or has power in a relationship or has certain abilities that others don't have. That's at its core what it means to be privileged. And we can be privileged for a bunch of different reasons in our world. We could be privileged because we're taller than everyone else and just, you know, that makes basketball a little bit easier. Got one basketball reference for you, Ezra, there you go. <laughs> but it's also a height reference. I don't know. Okay. We, that's a form of privilege. There's privilege in one's economic situation and what we're born into or what we're not. There are privileged groups based on status, immigration, race, a lot of different ways that we find ourselves either privileged or not privileged in a society. The question of what it means to be privileged, by the way, it's not it's not a sin to be privileged. It's not a problem to be privileged. It's a fact that happens when we live in a free society with random chance. Some people are going to have a leg up over others. Some people are going to have more. The question then becomes not, other times we'll talk about how we get the privilege or what that system looks like. The question that I want to talk about this morning is what we do with the privilege that we have. Because every single person in this room has some privilege in our lives. We have something that other people don't, even something we worked for, something we got, something that fell in our lap, something we were born into. We all have power and resources here. So the question becomes, what do we do with the privilege when we have it? And there's four vignettes in the Parsha that I want to look at that talk about different uses of privilege. So the first one that we see comes in the ordeal of the sota. And this is this moment where if a husband suspects his wife of infidelity, he brings her to the temple, gives her to the priests who give her some sort of magic potion to drink, and they ask her to confess, and they tell her if she's lying, bad things are going to happen. It's rather horrific. And another time we could go in depth into what this is. But this moment, I think, is a pretty clear-cut case of a misuse of privilege. Just one group that has power over another in this 
relationship. And there's not an ordeal if a woman suspects a man of infidelity. There's nothing. It's only if a man suspects a woman and all of this happens behind closed doors only with her. It's not great. And I think it's a relatively clear example of when we use our privilege to harm a group that does not have that privilege. The next that we see is the Nazir. Now the Nazir, a Nazir, is someone who takes an oath that they are going to, for some amount of time, abstain from the pleasures and joys of the world. Right there, they abstain from wine, they abstain from meat, they abstain from it, relatively everything. And it's usually for a certain amount of time, the Haftor is about someone who was his whole life, Shinshon, but being a Nazir, abstaining from the world, essentially becoming a monk or an ascetic, right? That's what, that's what we're talking about. This is something that is, see, is an option for us in the Torah, but the rabbis afterwards are quite ambivalent about whether or not it's a good thing, right? Ramban says it's a mitzvah to become a Nazir for at least some part in your life, right? That everyone at some point should do this thing where they sort of take a step back from society, abstain from everything, and, you know, have their sort of uh, meditative retreat. But the, but the Gemara says it's a sin to become a Nazir, that you're not allowed, that you, one should not become a Nazirite because we should not eschew the world that we live in. We need to be involved, we need to be engaged, and to take a step back is a mode of privilege, to be able to say, I don't really want to deal with the rest of the world. Like, I have the ability to sit in my house or my hut or the cave or wherever it is and live my life as I want to live it and meditate and think and work on me, which are very good things to do. It's okay for one to do that, but it does take a measure of privilege to know that you will be okay or to leave society and think well, it'll be fine even though I'm not a part of it. It's not something that we can't do. Again, I'm trying to be value neutral in this. It's an option that we have with the use of our privilege to try to step outside of the system. So now we look at the Nasi'im, the princes, the chiefs that we read at the beginning. So by definition, these are people of privilege because they're the heads of the tribes, right? They've got a lot of wealth. They're able to give, you know, how many silver buckets and things and herb, whatever you read that they're able to give, right? Okay, they've got a lot. They have something that they can do with it. So what do they do with their privilege? Well, they give to the community. They help build the Mishkan. They don't upend the system. They don't say, you know, I abdicate my, my leadership and uh, we're going to go to full dem democratic rule within the tribe of Naphtali. No, they stay in charge and they benefit from a system that gave them privilege, but they use the resources that they've been given to help others. Right? Rav Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev notes that the word that we use for nasi, which means prince or president or king ruler, comes from the root of the word to mean carry, to carry the people. And that part of what it means to be a leader in our people is to take that leadership and take whatever resources that we have and use it to help and uplift and carry those who don't. And this is a mode of how we can use our privilege, and I imagine it's a mode that many of us in this room engage in, whether we intentionally or not, right? That we take our privilege and, please God, we do good things with it. We help others. We try our best. We're not upending the entire system. We are benefiting from the privilege, but we are trying to pass it through to others at the same time to take on that leadership. And finally, there's the priests, the koanim that we see at the end. So the rabbis say that in order for the priests to give these blessings, that, the, that they actually can't happen in absentia. The priests have to be present. The people have to be there actually hearing the blessings. The priests are told to say the blessings slowly and unrushed. Rashbam points out that they have to look at each person that they bless and remember that they are conferring onto them the name of God, not their own names. The priests have to know whom they're blessing and see them and think specifically about the other, but specifically not about themselves. Priests cover themselves, right? When we do it here, they cover themselves, they cover their hands. The priests are this mode of 
complete self-effacing privilege, using whatever they've got by their birthright to try to be a conduit to bless others and leaving none of it for themselves. No name, no, the only name we even know is the, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. All the rest of the priests are relatively interchangeable. They're just, they're functionaries as they go through bringing the blessings of God onto the other people. Now, in some ways, this is the same response as the Nazir. It's erasing the self and one's privilege, yet it's different because they're channeling that withdrawal of self into helping others. Right? Now, this is actually can be an alluring and I think both frightening way of approaching one's privilege. Right? I think we'd all, in theory, like to use whatever extra resources we have to help others, but especially in the sort of hyper-informed world that we live in, it's hard to open the floodgates of need without the risk of being swept away, knowing about all of the problems that there are in the world that one could, in theory, use our resources to help. So we've seen four examples. The sota, I think, is an example of what not to do, to use one's privilege to oppress another group. The nazir, to remove oneself from the system, and say, I'm not going to be a part of whatever's going on here, is allowed. It's totally permissible to focus on oneself and one's own needs. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me, says Hillel. However, afterwards, the rabbis say, you have to bring a sin offering. So it's not something we should do all the time. It's necessary, but not always what desirable. The nasi, the prince, the king, the ruler, is the use of privilege in a way that maintains our privilege but still helps others at the same time. And the priest creates relationships, one-on-one -on -one relationships that channel that privilege into blessings, blessings of others and effaces oneself. So how are we in our world, in whatever privileges we find ourselves meant to use that privilege? We've got options. The important thing is that we have the conversation, that we acknowledge that there are ways in our life that we have privilege. We have things that we can do to help others, each and every one of us. There are times where we want and need to retreat, and that's okay. There are times where we are going to help someone but not necessarily give up the things that give us the privilege, and that's okay too. And there are times and will be times where we actually need to give up some of the standing or power that we have found ourselves in order to help a society and a system. All of these are options that we need to discuss and think about as we move our way in the world. All these are examples that we've seen for thousands of years. The question is, privilege will always be there. Please, God, may we have it. What are we going to do with it? Shabbat Shalom.